We've been looking at Jesus and the kingdom. And we're going to look at deliverance this morning. It says of Jesus in Acts, he went around doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. And so one of the aspects of the kingdom coming in and through Jesus the king is the freedom that he brings and the way that he sets people free, the way he liberates and rescues people from what the enemy of our souls, Satan the Bible calls him, is trying to do to wreck our lives. So Jesus brings the kingdom, it's justice, it's joy, it's peace, it's salvation, it's healing, it's deliverance. He is the one that launches heaven coming on the earth in increasing measure and how the rule and reign of God takes place in people and impacts places and this planet. We thought about a number of things in the lead up to this morning. We thought about how Jesus came saying that the, king, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. Turn your back on sin, turn towards God and put your faith in Jesus Christ. To be a Christian, which is the entry point of the kingdom, is repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It means turn around, change your mind, change your thinking, change your behaviour. Recognise that God is in the right, you are in the wrong, and start to live your life in alignment with his truth and his ways. And then we looked at Jesus bringing healing as a part of the kingdom. It tells us in the Old Testament that the Lord our God is our healer. Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. And here is the Lord in the midst of the people of Israel bringing healing. The Lord who heals. Jesus healed supernaturally as we looked at that. There were clearly doctors in his day. Luke, one of the gospel writers, was a doctor. But of course, medicine is far more advanced in our day. And some of the things we see happening through medicine today, if you or I would have lived 50 or 100 years ago, we would have said that they were miracles. They were miraculous. We couldn't have hoped or imagined what medics and surgery can do these days. And it's advancing all the while. And what we have to acknowledge is, it is the Lord his wisdom, his knowledge being imparted to humanity that has enabled those things to heaven. So God still heals supernaturally, he still heals through prayer, he still heals in miraculous ways, but he also heals through medicine. And both of them are marvellous testimonies. There isn't one way that's better than the other. He heals through both. And whenever uh, I have ever prayed for anyone, to uh, receive healing. We've seen some incredible answers. We've seen uh, people continue to struggle with their health. But one of the things I always say is you do not stop taking any medication until the doctors tell, it, tell you you need it no longer. No matter how much better you might feel, um, let it be confirmed by a doctor. Now, the thing for us is who do we look to first when it comes to our need for healing? Do we acknowledge the one who is the source behind it all in first place? Or do we tend to put our trust just in the medical and surgical profession? There's an example for us in scripture, King Asa, one of the better kings, one of the good kings. He did really, really well until the end of his life. And at the end of his life, because he'd been quite successful as a king, maybe it got to him a little bit and uh, he was uh, celebrating his success, but he struggled with his feet. Whether he had gout or not, we don't know, but it sounds like he may have had gout. But it says he looked to the medics rather than looking to God. So we need to be careful. We put our trust firstly in God and not just in medicine. I, I'm not saying don't go to the doctor. Of course, if you're not well, go to the doctor. There's so much they can do. But uh, let's be looking to God, who is 
the healer and the source of all healing rather than just trusting in what's available in our day. And here is Jesus bringing deliverance as a part of the kingdom. And uh, we look at a few scriptures. These are all from the Gospels. Two from the Gospel, one from uh, John's letters. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come amongst you. So one of the things that Jesus did was cast out demons from people's lives. What we need to recognise, and we're not very good at it in Western society, is this world is more than flesh and blood and bone and stone and earth and things solid and physical. There is a spiritual realm that is active and uh, that spiritual realm impacts and works through the physical realm. When God made the earth, they were perfectly joined together, but through the fall of man, they've become fractured and Jesus has won a victory upon the cross so that one day they will come back into perfect alignment and all will be made well again. And things, quite rightly, as Fian has explained to us, things will be better in the life to come than they've ever been up to this point. So there's a spiritual world, and demons operate in that, but they seek to influence and impact people's lives. We'll think more about that. This is from Mark. Now, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, another way of saying a demon was affecting him and he cried out saying let us alone what have we to do with you Jesus of Nazareth did you come to destroy us I know who you are the Holy One of God and this seems to happen quite a bit in Jesus's ministry as you read through the Gospels the demons know who he is and why he's come he has come to destroy them he has come to prevent what they're doing in people's lives and they recognise him as God's holy and anointed one. Jesus tells them to be quiet often and silences them because he wants people to understand who he is through their searching and seeking rather than to be told by the enemy. And then the Apostle John writes to us, he who sins is of the devil for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Man was manifested. This, this was a, one of the reasons the Son of Man came, Jesus, the Saviour, came to earth that he might destroy the works of the devil. The devil is a liar, he's a thief, he comes to kill, to steal and destroy. And Jesus has come to destroy his works. Scripture uh, hints to us that there are more on God's side, there are more angels working in obedience to him than there are those who are working alongside Satan that rebelled with him and rejected God's authority. So there <coughs> it, it seems to suggest revelation, uh, there's that moment in Two Kings where Elisha uh, asks for his servant's eyes to be opened because they're surrounded by a huge army and then the servant's eyes is opened and there are uh, chariots of fire all around and there's more on their side than against them. And in the book of Revelation, it suggests there's at least two-thirds angels compared to a third demon. So there's more on our side and we are on the winning side. That is the good news for us. Jesus is the deliverer. Jesus is the liberator. Jesus is the one that rescues us. The word, the scriptures use in relation to this is the word sozo it means uh, to be saved to be made whole it means to be freed uh, to be healed freedom rescue from the influence of satanic attack or affliction demons are opportunists they're looking for opportunities to influence and impact people's lives when we believe lies that opens the door for them it gives them an invitation to whisper lies into our ears each and every one of us 
are surrounded by so many different ideas and philosophies, aren't we? We want to be those that embrace and live in the light of God's truth. But we have to recognize that there are many ideas and philosophies around us that are diabolical. They are influenced by demons. They are the doctrines of demons. And they are seeking to bring us down and to draw us away from God and his light and his life and his truth. There are literally hundreds of them, which is why it's so important we spend time in the word of God and listening to the Holy Spirit so that we discern these things and are not led astray by them. Jesus uh, outlines deliverance as a part of his kingdom manifesto in Luke chapter 4. We looked at that last time. He comes to set the captives free and to bring freedom to those who are oppressed. That has a spiritual outworking as well as an emotional outworking. And deliverance demonstrates the kingdom of God breaking into the earth. If I, by the finger of God, a reference to God writing the law, I'm here with under God's authority. If I, under God's authority, drive out demons, know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. Know that the kingdom of God has broken into this life and broken into this world. And also, as healing is taking place, as salvation is taking place, as deliverance is taking place, what is happening is Satan is being cast out. Satan is being thrown out of heaven. Remember when Jesus sends the disciples out, he gives them authority to heal all diseases and to drive out demons. And as they go and they do that, they come back and they're rejoicing. They are so happy. They're celebrating what God has done in them and through them. And Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. When does he see Satan fall like lightning from heaven? As they are healing people and as they're seeing people set free. As the kingdom of God is coming in and through the people of God, Satan is being destroyed and Satan is being cast out. How does Jesus deliver people? Jesus delivers people through his own authority. We saw in the scripture we read from Mark there, the demons recognized who Jesus was. They manifested in his presence. When he was speaking or when he was ministering, when he was praying for people, they kind of just showed their presence. He didn't go around hunting them down. He didn't go around shouting them out. And sometimes you've kind of seen that in some of the approaches that we've seen in the church. Jesus simply sought to walk in obedience to the Father, to be perfectly partnered with the Holy Spirit, to get on with God, what, what God had told him to do, to bring God's truth, to preach the kingdom, and to explain the scriptures. And as he did that, demons manifested. As they manifested, he silenced them, and he drove them out. In many of the instances where there's a power encounter in the Gospels, as Jesus deals with the demonic, there seems to be an overlap between physical illness and demonic influence. Where one starts and the other ends, that's all a little bit of a mystery, and it's not easy to discern those things. But Jesus deals with every occurrence of demonic manifestation that he comes across, and he sets people free. He brings freedom, and there's often physical manifestations in the people that he sets free. There's either something they speak out or there's something begins to happen in their bodies. I remember when Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he finds a father distressed and coming to Jesus with a complaint because Jesus' disciples have been unable to bring deliverance to his boy who's been affected by a demon since he was young. And as Jesus begins to minister, the demon throws him onto the floor and he convulses. What looks like us in our modern day, a classic case of epilepsy. But Jesus doesn't pray for healing. Jesus 
prays for deliverance and then the boy is completely set free. There's something physical happens often when people are being set free from demonic activity or influence in their lives. How does the demons take opportunities, lies, sin, certain habits or lifestyle behaviours that we indulge in, just invite that kind of activity around us. They work on deception. They're always seeking to tempt us. We know that temptation doesn't come from God and God always gives us an opportunity to flee and escape temptation. Temptation comes from the enemy. And also trauma. When we've experienced lots of trauma, that can be sometimes an entry point for the enemy. Jesus, as I've said, uh, dealt with demons. He cast them out. He drove them out. He delivered and set free the person. Maybe the um, case where the demonic is influencing a person the most is the time when Jesus calms the wind and the waves and then they come to the other side of the lake of Galilee in the Gadarene as it's called let me read it from the Gospel of Luke then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes which is opposite Galilee and when he stepped out on the land there met him a certain man from the city who had had demons for a long time this man has been influenced and impacted by the demonic over a long time he wore no clothes he's naked nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. He's naked and he's living in a graveyard. This man has been dehumanized by the demonic activity in his life. Despite this, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. The very presence of Jesus brings torment to the demonic, which is why they begin to manifest. For Jesus, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. But it had often seized him and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. So there's a wildness about this man there's a violence about this man that he's got to be tied out. There's a restlessness under about this man. These are some of the things that the demonic can bring in people's lives. Jesus asked him, saying, what is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. Legion, a Roman legion, was about 6,000 soldiers. Now, that doesn't mean that there are 6,000 demons, but there are many demons <coughs> in this man. And yet Jesus is able to deliver him like that. And they begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. This, uh, we, this abyss is talked about in Revelation, the place of destruction for evil and uh, those who have been involved in it. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them. And he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. So the purpose of the demonic, the purpose of these many demons in this man is to try and kill him. His mind somehow was able to resist that, although he had been so dehumanized through their presence and activity in his life. As soon as they enter the demons, the demons go, m uh, sorry, the pigs, as soon as they enter the pigs, the pigs go mad and headlong into the sea. So, suggest to me the uh, animal mind is not as strong as the human mind when it comes to resisting evil. But it also reveals to us the purpose of the demonic is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. It's to dehumanize us, destroy us, and ultimately kill us. 
That's what the enemy is trying to do. He knows he's been defeated and he's trying to take as many with him. Here's the thing. The man, when they saw what had happened and came to Jesus, they found the man to whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Jesus is the one that can bring us back to our right minds. Jesus is the one that can bring freedom in our lives. How wonderful is that? How does Jesus bring deliverance? Let's look at another scripture. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, or Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Now that word means prince of devils, lord of dung, or lord of flies. Where do flies go? Flies go to messy, nasty places, don't they? The demonic is nasty, messy. And it seeks to mess up people's lives. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided in against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, or prince of devils, by whom do your people drive them out? So Jesus is effectively saying, your argument's a load of rubbish, not based on any rational thought, because you've got exorcists as well. You've got Jewish priests that drive out demons. <laughs> so why do you have a problem with me doing it? Maybe because Jesus is a lot more successful than they were. So <coughs> if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God, then, sorry, if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God is about deliverance. Again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. So Jesus is saying that Satan is a strong man but I am a even stronger man. I come to bind the strong man, to chain him up, and to cast him out. Jesus did that on two fronts. He did it on a private level, when he, the Holy Spirit compelled him and drove him out into the deep wilderness, and there he was tempted by the devil in every way for 40 days, and Jesus overcame the devil. Jesus won the private battle in the wilderness. And then he won the public battle on Calvary. The devil had nothing in him. The devil is looking for a barb, an influence in our lives. And then he's looking for a foothold, which if we're not careful and we allow to grow, can become a stranglehold. And then a stranglehold can become a stronghold a stronghold in our minds so that we begin to believe lies about God and lies about ourselves and we begin to be increasingly influenced by what the enemy is speaking into our lives rather than what God is speaking into our lives. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. 1 John 4 verse 5. The Jewish exorcists, as an example of that in Acts chapter 19, these seven sons of Sceva who try to drive a demon out of a man and the demon says, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? They had tried to drive out the demon in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. They didn't have a relationship with Jesus. They were not operating out of intimacy with Jesus 
and out of the authority of God. They were trying to use a formula that if I know your name, it gives me power and authority over you. That was the thinking in their day. So if I can name you, I can overcome you. But it didn't work. The demon beat them up and they ran um, beaten up and naked from the hole. So the demonic can be um, violent and aggressive at times. In the scriptures we read about evil spirits, unclean spirits, impure spirits and demons. And they are often one or sometimes more. In this case of legion, there were many. We're not told exactly how many, but as I've said, legion of Roman soldiers was 6,000. So there must have been quite a few demons present in this man. Mary Magdalene, we know that Jesus drove out seven demons from her. Now the key thing is, when deliverance ministry is taking place, it's done in Jesus' name. It's about taking authority. It's about silencing what any demon might try to do. You don't need to ask them loads of questions. You just take authority and silence them and say, out, in Jesus' name. What is happening when that takes place is the demon leaves and in this example from Luke 11, you can look it up later, Luke 11, the demon leaves, it goes into the desert, it goes into uh, a wilderness space and it's looking for somewhere to rest. Holy Spirit's looking to rest on our lives. Rested on Jesus and always remained. If we will walk in harmony with Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit will rest on our lives. We will not quench him, we will not resist him, we will not... There's another one, I can never remember the three. Grieve, yes, we'll not grieve the Spirit. So in the same way, the evil spirits are looking for somewhere to rest, somewhere to call home. So if we drive a demon out of someone, we have to fill the vacuum. Because Jesus goes on to explain here what is happening when you drive the demon out. It's like you're cleaning the house. You've done a good spring clean. You've made everything clean and tidy. But if you're not careful, if we don't fill it with the right things, the demon will come back with a few friends and think, my home's been made nice and clean and tidy. Oh, yes, thank you very much. And that can happen if people don't embrace Jesus as saviour and if people don't get filled with the Holy Spirit. And even after doing those two things, they have to keep taking responsibility for their lives and they have to keep choosing Jesus. I've been involved in a number of deliverances uh, and different times. Uh, some of them quiet, quick, people set free very easily, others taking a little bit of time and some quite um, powerful manifestations. So, but the key thing is get them to acknowledge Jesus as Saviour, get them filled with the Holy Spirit and that way they have far more chance of avoiding falling back into the old ways. Some people do go back to the old ways. Um, but we know that people that become Christians can drift away, don't we? So, so important to fill the vacuum. I personally prefer to talk about demonic oppression, demonic affliction, the impact that they have on people's lives. I think the reality is we see very, very few people as drastically affected by the demonic as Jesus with this man in the gathering wilderness. He, we could say, was possibly possessed, but he wasn't possessed to the point where he'd lost completely his mind, had he? Because they wanted to kill. The pigs went instantly. He still, there was still a taint of humanity left about him. But he, he was, the way he was living was so dehumanised. The reality is we don't, we don't see people 
as badly affected as that very often do. Not in our Western society. I'm not saying people are not affected. I believe they are. There are, there are types of behavior, there are types of thinking that just attracts the enemy, like flies coming to dung. It can be like that. So we need to be careful how we live, because how we live matters, and it matters every which way. So Jesus heals and delivers, sets people free in his authority. And he gave the disciples authority to heal all diseases and to drive out demons. Gave them authority in his day. He gives us authority in our day. Jesus continues to deliver yesterday, today and forever. But we as his disciples and followers, we bring deliverance in Jesus' name and through Jesus' authority. <coughs> because he is the freedom bringer. The key, key thing is the battle for the mind. If Satan can establish that stronghold in your mind, it can be hard to break free from that. So it's important we keep turning our back on every diabolical idea and philosophy. And there are so many that surround us and we come across every day of our lives. Let us Jesus, we thank you that you are the saviour, the ultimate strongman, that you who live in us are greater than he that lives in the world. We thank you that you bring freedom in whom the Son sets free is free indeed, and that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So, Father, we ask that in our lives, in our bodies, in our minds, in our spirits and souls, that you would set us free from every diabolical idea and philosophy, everything in our lives and in our thinking that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Father, will you break its power in our lives, in Jesus' name, and will you bring your freedom? Father, will you fill us afresh with your spirit, Father, that we might submit to you and resist the devil each and every day of our lives. We thank you, Lord, that as we submit to you, you fill us with your spirit, you draw us into a deeper walk with you, you, you bring your righteousness and holiness into our lives. And Father, we thank you that as we resist the devil, he will flee away from us. So Father, help us to stand firm in your truth. And Father, where as and when we need it. Father, let us have confidence and conviction to walk and stand and move in the authority that you have given us to overcome the enemy and cast him out of our lives and other people's lives. For your glory, Lord, this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.